everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers from around the world meet here to connect, inspire, and create. My guests captivate us with their images, inspire us with their stories, and they share valuable tips on how you can improve your photography skills. The schedule for upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to previous sessions on Linda Nichols' Happiness Hour YouTube channel. Tonight's guest is Charlotte Rhodes. Charlotte is a wildlife photographer based in the United Kingdom, whose love for the animals of the Masa, Masa Mara continue to draw her back to the uncomparable African plains of Kenya. Charlotte's images are more than just snapshots of the big five. They are intimate portraits that reflect the relationship between a mother cheetah and her cubs, or the, or the protective ring of elephants around the newest member of its herd. Sometimes her subject is the last ray of sunlight on the horizon that dwarfs a giraffe silhouette. Every image has its own story, a moment that can only be seen because of the click of her shutter. In tonight's presentation, My Africa Dream, Charlotte will take us on a safari and share some of her favorite images from her happy place, the Masa Mara. If you're on Instagram, you can find her at Charlotte Rhodes Wildlife, and I'll link that in the show notes. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Charlotte. Thank you, Linda. I am so, so, so excited to have you here. And um, I kind of already confessed when we first, before we started recording, um, I know you, you're one of my Instagram pals. Um, um, for the people that might be watching this, um, because several people in different time zones said, I'm going to watch this when you post it on Friday, because um, they follow you on Instagram, but they just could not stay up to watch it live. <laughs> so um, first of all, Charlotte is in England, and she is six hours ahead of us. So we're talking way past 1 a.m. for her. Um, and I I really didn't think you would say yes to um, <laughs> coming. I to didn't a few hours ago either. <laughs> and so I'm so excited. And um, like I said, you were one of the first people to introduce me to wildlife photography. You know, I, I grew up watching some of the discovery channels and the animal kingdoms and, and the same, you know, shows that maybe you watched, um, but they were just on TV. And when you <clears throat> follow somebody, like I follow you, I feel like you put me in the seat with you. And, and spoiler alert, sometimes she does. She sends me videos from her story, <laughs> like right then and there. And that is so fun, um, especially when my view is not the same as yours at that particular moment. So it does um, it's fun to follow along with other people doing these amazing trips. And I know this is something that um, you absolutely love and um, look forward to with every trip. So with that, I skimmed over a bio because when I know somebody, I feel like I don't know what to say about them. So um, I didn't know what to say about you. Did I miss anything or is there something that um, you sh would like to share or if that's part of your presentation? I'll, yeah, I'll just I'll, I won't bore people with a long stream about me, but I'll I'll give a little insight about why I got where I am, I suppose. Okay. Well, with that, thank you for doing this for my group, and um, I'm going to hand it over to you. I think we can so, you see that now. It says it's you've started sharing it, but it's a black screen. Yeah, sure, that's right. That's fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> that was actually All right. intentional. Okay. All right. With that, then you're good to go. Okay, excellent. So I guess a little bit about me. I um, 
I guess I was always a child that was obsessed about wildlife and my mum loved all the beetles and everything that I brought into the house. But it wasn't until I got into um, into the early 2000s that I first went to Africa. And it's something that I'd always wanted to do. I you know, was always watching David Attenborough um, documentaries as a child and I always dreamt about going. Um, but it wasn't until um, really 2009 when I, I went um, to an area called Alari Motorogi Conservancy, which is an area right on the border of the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Um, I went on a photography trip. I hadn't taken my camera out of automatic at, at that stage. I didn't know how to uh, arrive. Everyone had got huge lenses and all the rest of it. Completely felt intimidated, but I totally fell in love with with the place, with the guides, everything else. And and since then, I've been as much as I can. Um, even during twenty at the end of twenty twenty, if I've got a chance to go, I, I, I'm heading back. Um, I do go to the parts of the world. I, I also now enjoy after lockdown photographing in the UK, which I wasn't really doing before. Um, but this is where my heart is, and it's somewhere that's really really special to me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously going to go through photos. There's a few um, videos in there as well. Um, I apologise now because they're really poor quality, but it's really, um, you know, it's me with my iPhone. I hate the thought of uh, putting my camera in video mode most of the time because I might miss a shot. Um, so I think that's probably me being, being a bit old school, but there's there's not very much video in there, but it's, there's a few small, few small ones, especially at the start, just to give you a little bit of a feel about what it's like. Um, but I think, I mean, the big thing for me, and, and this is about, you know, sorry, I've forgotten your names, but the, the ladies that are going in June, the big thing really is about being there. And it's, you know, my photos, it's really about how do I try and capture the feel of being of being there, but it's all of the sounds and all of the birds flying around and lots and lots of wildlife around you and these huge skies. And and really that for me is is one of the you know the, the most amazing things of being there and seeing the photos for me obviously is a big reminder of of that feeling as well but i'll just step through um i've, I've kind of put it into three different sections first of all it's really about my favorite time of day um, and that's first thing in the morning, not, not half past one in the morning, but, um, you know, it's really the start of the day and the excitement that that brings. Um, then I'm going to cover um, cheetahs. So um, probably one of my favourite things to photograph and we'll go through why. Um, and then at the end, um, there's a there's a cat, that, specific cat that's been very special to me that I spent 10 years following, um, a leopard called Fig. And I just wanted to quickly talk through um you know how I got to first meet her and and her her, her cubs, but also some of my favourite sort of shots and moments with with her as well, if that's okay. And happy to answer um, questions throughout. I've also just had a quite a bad cold, so my voice is a little bit. Um, so if I have a bit, of, if I need to have a few glasses of water, um, I'll, I'll have to do that as well. I'm afraid. Not a problem. Okay. Right. So. Um, lovely, <laughs> great photo to start with. So I guess in the mornings, um, it, it's the best time of day for me. It's really important when you're on safari to actually get out when it's dark. And so the best time of day for me is, is the morning. And the reason for that is you, you have all the excitement of the day. You don't know what's going to come along, but you've generally got a plan. You know, it might be that you left something the night before, uh, so a cat the night before, and you know roughly where they're located. So you'll head back there. You might have got some intelligence or even you might have heard things through the night and you know that things are close by. But at the same time, you know, when you head out, you might have a plan, but something may change. And it's, it's really important, I think, to get out as early as you can. Um, yes, it might be dark when you first head out, but it just means that you hopefully can find something before the light starts to pick up. At the same time, you know, things are moving. So there's certain um, species that are nocturnal that you wouldn't see at other times. And, you know, things like lions, um, you know, as soon as it gets a bit warm, they find a nice place and a bit of shade and they go to sleep. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I get woken up incredibly early. Um, don't really like it at the time, drink lots of strong coffee. Um, you know, and this lovely video of a, of a, of a bit of the tent, but if you can hear, This is just lions, right? So 
got up one morning and this is lines just out, well, not just outside the tent. They're actually, actually not as close as they sound, but in some cases they are right outside of the tent. And it's just that excitement and knowing full well that you're going to be heading out and hopefully seeing them. And, you know, a few metres outside of uh, outside of camp and we're having to stop and there's lions there, there's an elephant crossing, there's quite a lot of interaction between those species. So it's just, a, I don't know, it's just all that excitement and that build up. And the, and the beautiful thing, I think, is also around how the light then develops. So you go out in the dark, you start to see um, the wildlife moving, you can hear, hear the noises out there, the lions calling, hyenas calling and so on. And then the light starts to pick up and you start to see um, beautiful colours. Obviously, you know, it doesn't happen every day and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later probably as well. But here, you know, you've got to, in, in the, the Mara in particular, there's lots of open plains there's dots, dots of um, trees throughout. And, and in this particular image, it's a very um, traditional tree that you would, a specific tree that you would see in the Maasai Mara. There's three birds, if you can see that on there, they're, they're called marabou stalks. They're the undertakers of, of, of Africa. So they go out and they, they're the scavengers. They're probably one of the ugliest birds you would ever see. And I, I don't even know if I've got a photo of them in daylight because they are that ugly. Um, but it's just they're starting to get the mood and starting to get as they starting to get the skies as they build up. And as you as you're moving across, you know, and generally speaking, it, first thing in the morning at that time, I'll be looking either for elephants or for giraffes because trying to get those big species in front of the beautiful skies or alternatively trying to find the cats um, so that when the light does pick up, you're there when the when the most perfect light is is happening. Um, in this case, it's just two crown cranes um, crossing um, crossing the sky, and we were just sat with some cheetahs at the time, waiting for light to pick up, and, and they flew across. But it's just picking up that that beauty of of the different types of species that are there. Um, if you're very lucky, you also you know there's certain things I guess from a photography's perspective that that. Um, that, that are nice to have. And there's a little bit later, there's a bit, little bit about dust and backlight on dust. But um, in this particular case, there's certain areas of the Mara that are, that are marshland. Um, and, and first thing in the morning, in, as in this case, um, you know, you've got the light starting to build up, but you've got the mist. Um, it, it can mean you're incredibly cold. So I know everyone has views of Africa being warm and being sunny and being hot. First thing in the morning, I often go out and I might have got five layers on. I've got a woolly hat on. I've got ski socks on. They give me a hot water bottle to try and keep warm. And you can imagine when you're actually sat in the mist, it's very, very cold. But in this case, um, there was a whole herd of elephant and they were moving through this marshland. One stuck back and continued to feed. And, and for me, it's a shot where... Um, I really feel quite a lot of calmness when I look at it because it, you know, there's also that thing where it's it, it's it's very quiet. There's very few people around. It's just you're just hearing the movement of the animals. And with something like a an elephant, you know, you can sit there and you can actually hear them physically pulling that grass out of, out um, from the roots. In some cases, you might hear them kicking just to try and loosen the roots. So you're sat there and you've got that all those noises as well as they eat and they and they. They chomp their food and it, it's a really, really beautiful thing to experience. If you're very lucky, you also, you know, you might find a lion or, or other, other cats crossing as that, that light starting to pick up. And in this case, it was a case of, of there being quite a bit of rain. Lions are kind of huddled together and they, they do often, you know, unless it's you get rain during the day, you only really see them moving around at the, at the start of the day and at, at the end of the evening. If you've got cubs, they might just be a little bit more boisterous. But yeah, this is just really the light, lights picking up and a lion's actually going off um, to hunt in this case. One of the things I, I really do like um, is trying to sort of, pick, you know, I've already mentioned in terms of the big skies that you get. And um, and I, I think it's probably made me appreciate sky. From going there, it's actually made me appreciate skies a lot more in my, in you know, when I'm in other places in the world, and including where I live. I, I live in an area which, which is very flat, um, and you know, when you do go out in the countryside, there, there's, there's there's hillier areas that we can go to, or there's there's very flat 
um, areas. And it's just when there's watching those clouds move and the clouds develop. Um, in this particular case, we found elephants again, it was dark. They were eating um, down by a riverbed. They started to move onto the plains and as the light was picking up. And, you know, it's really important when you go that, um, you know, if, if possible, you can try and investigate whether or not you, you know, the guides that you get, because there's a whole ethics around guides. And it's important that you're, give, you're, you're respectful to the animals. You're not getting too close. Um, you know, if you're taking photos with iPhones, it's not, you know, <laughs> you've, got, you've got to understand that, um, you know, you, it, you shouldn't be getting really, really close to those animals and disturbing them because you want to get a shot because you don't have the gear. I mean, it's sit back and enjoy it is a really critical thing. Um, but, first, but also the value of a guide in terms of positioning you. And, you know, I've been very, very lucky to meet a few really wonderful guides who, in this particular case, it's James. Some of these photos were taken with a um, guy called Patrick and others with, with a guy called Jimmy, um, who I've got to know over the years. But they are, you know, they really love their species. They're, they're really good about positioning, so it makes it a lot easier for me. Um, but also, you know, the fact that they love these, these animals, in many cases, they've seen a lot of the cats, for instance, develop and grow and, you know, love them probably more than any of the guests. So the positioning is really important. Um, but in this, you know, in this particular shot, it's also about trying to use different lenses as well. Um, it's very, in this particular case, I, I was using a wide angle lens. Um, I'm very low to the ground because the last thing you want to do is, is sort of chop the log, leg, legs off of the animals. When, when you're taking silhouette shots in particular, it's how do you make sure that people can see that it is actually a herd of elephants. It's not just a, a few rocks on the, you know, blobs on the, on the horizon. And, and so, you know, I've got, I think I was about substituting at something like 17 mil in terms of a focal length. So it's really to try and get that idea of that big, big sky and and it's not necessarily everybody's cup of tea but I love the fact that it gives you the drama of the of the clouds and the dark the darkness the sun's obviously rising behind them and um but they're very small in frame so I think I actually call this shot they might be giants a few seconds later actually um this isn't this is exactly the same um sighting so it really is um it's you know you can see how the sun was was moving up and this is just really, you know, picking up a different, uh, different lens. And in this case, um, I'm using a zoom lens and, and the sun's just rising. And I'm, I'm obviously focusing on an individual elephant in this case. So it just gives you an idea that it's exactly the same sighting. It could be that you're stood next to this, you know, one person experiencing exactly the same thing, but you could end up with two very, very different shots, depending on what it is that you're picking up. And... Um, you know, another shot in terms of elephants, again, you know, if you if you ever do get the chance to go, and I think this is the same with, you know, some of the UK wildlife as well, is thinking about where you're positioning yourself. Um, and not only, you know, if in something like if you're in a vehicle in terms of, you know, do you move backwards and forwards, but also if you can change your height, it's really, you know, very important as well. And in, again, in this in this shot, I'm as low as I possibly can be. If you know the danger is, if I was slightly higher, I wouldn't be able to see the gap between between their legs and the horizon. And and in this particular case, it's one of those mornings where there wasn't any colour at all. Uh, the sun rose, no clouds, as you can see. So it's a very different atmosphere than the previous ones. But I've turned it into black and white because because I think it really really suits this image in terms of you still get the silhouettes and you can obviously make out the the individual elephants. Um, I think my I think my aperture's something like f twenty or something. So you get the 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 um, the sun in in that way. But it's just to give again. It's just a different way of of seeing a, a, a the morning sunrise. Charlotte, there's a question that popped up while we're talking about the elephants. Um, Jamie's curious, are you shooting with different bodies with different lens, you know, different lenses? Or are you swapping lenses like on your same body? Yeah, um, I now generally if I now generally will take um a few bodies. And and I think even if you um if you do go, even if it's a very, very, um, you, you know, it's your old one or something like that, or you borrow from somebody. It's just that fact that you've got flexibility that if something changes and you quickly want to change what you're doing, you've just got that flexibility. 
Um, also, if it, it can be dusty at times. Sometimes you go, there's no dust, but it's obviously, it just minimizes any sort of damage to your, to your camera and your lenses. But I do think that, um, especially if you're going on a trip that you don't do very often, so you're, um, you know, if your camera broke and something went wrong, you've at least got some flexibility. I, I would recommend if you can, that you take a second body. And then since I've already interrupted, let me ask another one. Then, Susan's curious. Um, she wants to know, how are you changing your height? Because she's assuming that you can't get out of the vehicle. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's very rare that I will get out of the vehicle. And I definitely, you know, I would never get out of the vehicle without permission from the, from the guide, obviously. Um, and they will be, you know, they will have monitored the area very closely to make sure there, was, there wasn't anything to be concerned about. In this particular case, you know, if I have got out, it's in a completely open plane, so there's no way for, you know, things like buffaloes to hide and so on. And you do get out at times, you know, maybe for breakfast or if you need the bathroom or something like that. But yeah, most of them will be in the vehicle. In terms of how I get different heights, um, in this particular case, in, in, well, now when I when I go, there's there's vehicles that are available which actually you can put the sides down and you can actually lay down in the vehicle. Um, and in some cases, uh, I haven't got any photo on here, actually, but, um, you know, you, you, I'll be dangling myself out so that I can hold my camera low down. But you don't need to necessarily go down to that extent. But it's just that, you know, if you are always taking photos when you're when you're sat in the in the in the Jeep, you, you know, you can just find that you're always looking down on something. And it's just trying to move around and just make sure you see, just check your perspectives, really. I think with a lot of the. The, the big animals or when you, you're trying to do silhouettes in the morning, you, it's really trying to, um, you know, make sure you're not cutting those legs off in this particular case. But I do think if you're taking any uh, giraffe or elephant or um, any sort of that sort of species that I, I would advise that you, you at least have a look to see if it gives you a different, um, a different view when, when you're there. But I even, I mean, I said, even when I see people shooting wildlife in the UK, I'll often see people, you know, whether it's birds and owls and things or, or hares, I'll often see people, you know, they'll be stood up, um, they'll stand in the same place for three hours, which sometimes does work, but, you know, moving around because of the light or just getting different angles is quite important. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just moving quickly on to giraffe again, You, I mean, this is, you know, this is some of the beautiful colors. These don't happen all the time. This is, you know, a number of photos I've taken over a number of years. Um, but, you know, one of the things I, I like about this is just how those, those, you've got those different shades of colors through the photo. You can see I've not cl clipped the legs off, but also, um, and I'll come to it a bit later on, but it's also about the position of the legs as well in this particular case. So, you know, you've got four distinctive legs. Sometimes you'll see shots and it'll make them look like they've only got three legs or something. It's just, for me, it's just a really nice position. And there's a whole thing about composition and being in the, obviously in the corners of, of the angle and so on. But to me, you know, I remember when I, when I took this and it's just that fact that it, you've got almost like a silence when the, when the sun's starting to rise, but it's just the buildup of the colours. And I do see people when I'm at, at camp that, you know, will be leaving camp at this time or a bit later. And of course, they've missed this by the time they've already got out. Um, slightly different shot of a giraffe. The thing that would make it for me with that is that, you know, the flick of the tail. Obviously, the light's um, a, a lot higher than where it was in the previous shot. And in this particular case, you know, we're talking about getting low. You can, I'm actually lower than the, you know, I'm almost touching the floor here. So I'm actually looking up at the giraffe rather than straight on. So totally different sky again. So different sort of drama, but you can see, you know, the giraffe looks a bit distorted because I'm, I'm shooting at 17 mil on a, on a full frame camera. And it's, but it's just that, you know, it's just a totally different perspective again from, from the other shots. And finally, this is actually an evening, it's not in the morning, so I've cheated a little bit, but it's, it, we, we, we um, got towards the end of the day and it, there was no sunset at all, it didn't look like there was going to be any colour, heading back to camp and then just the sky just changed. And it's just, you know, things can be quite dramatic. And this was just a lone bull elephant. It was coming down the hill, going down to the riverbed. They often go down there and will feed through the night rather than stay in the open plains. 
And um, it's just one of those things that was totally unexpected, only happened for a few seconds. It's actually one of my favorite giraffe shots because again, it just, you know, these are really big animals, even the babies, I, you know, I haven't got any photos of babies through here, but the babies are over six foot tall. So the way, way taller than me when they're already born. Um, and sometimes when you're in a vehicle, because you're already higher up, you don't really feel how big they actually are. Um, but, you know, again, it's a, it's a picture which just makes them look small. And, and But you've got that big expanse around them. And that's one of the things that I really, you know, love about being there. Um, so there are obviously, I'm not going to cover very many other species of the uh, um of wildlife which you know there are lots and lots of <laughs> beautiful species and you know and it's trying to I find it often quite hard to actually um, find photos that really um you know if it, things like zebras think some of the gazelle and so on they're beautiful in their own right but it's quite hard to take shots that actually have got some meaning for them uh, um, and do them justice I suppose it's a lot harder than, than some of the other species I like this one because um, one of the things about zebras is that they make this really ridiculous call they sound like they're laughing and, and in the photo they, they're both um, laughing away the one thing I would say, you know, we talked, I mentioned about legs and everything. If the the, the the giraffe wasn't there on the left hand side, the one on the right, you know, he's got <laughs> my criticism. My own shots is can't see the tail, can't see the you know the back legs. Looks like it's just one back leg. So if there was only one one zebra in this shot, it, it would have been deleted for me, if I'm honest. Um, and that's another thing, you know, if you if you've been one, if if I showed the my photos of my first trip, and then obviously you get a lot more choosy when you've been a lot more trips, but it's just the fact that I like this because it gives me the humour of the zebra. Um, but it is, you know, it's not a perfect shot by any means. And, and this is, you know, you, you in the Mara, it's, they do um, have the migration passing through between Tanzania and, um, and the Maasai Mara. Um, so there are certain times of year where there are a lot of uh, wildebeest around. And here it's one of those, you know, blood red skies at the end of the day. Um, and I just like the symmetry of the two wildebeest. My biggest complaint is the wildebeest on the left has got a rather chopped tail. I don't know whether or not he got attacked by a by a lion at some point and got part of its tail ripped off. But, you know, it's always one of those things when you look at your own shots and what would you change? But I can't really change his tail. And I'm not somebody that adds things and takes things out either. So anyway, very quickly, this is kind of, you know, when I when we're out in the morning, this is what I was saying about, the, about you know, when I go, that I have the side taken off the vehicle. Um, but it's really, you know, we'll be out um, looking around and just, you know, the sky's starting to develop and we're looking for species as we move along. And that was James. Um, so I think when we went in, in July, um, you know, I, I've shown you know, some really nice morning skies. We met in July, the first four days, I think were cloudy at the start of the day, cloudy at the end of the day. Um, and, and we didn't get any good light whatsoever. And we went out um, on the fifth morning of, and we're, we were there for six for six days. And um, and as we were driving along, we had got a plan to go so to try and find a certain pride of lions. And on the way there, we found some lionesses with some cubs that had, had made a kill through the night. So they got a wildebeest. Um, and then the sky just started to, to rise. And and um, and Jimmy, um, our guide that day, saw this lioness who was in a perfect position um, with the sun behind her and, 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 and kindly positioned us there. So to be honest, you know, this is one of the things, sometimes photography is kind to you. And in this case, you know, a lot of credit goes to, to, to the guides as well, especially obviously when, you know, you can't just jump out of the Jeep and, and, and run over and, and take a photo because you want to be in a certain position. But um, one of the, the things for me is, you know, if you can get that morning light, get the light behind, it's only for a very small window. But, you know, some people don't like backlight, but for me, it really emphasizes the cat, you, you know, the golden colors that are there, eye contact with 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 the lion. And it's just that glow around the lion that that, um, you know, I particularly love. And then, you know, kind of an iconic cheetah shot, really. Um, cheetahs are just such a beautiful animal and, and we'll cover cheetahs now, but 
for me, you know, you, there were people that were shooting from the other angle, incidentally, uh, um, on this occasion. And I've got a, a, a cheetah in nice golden light. But I love the fact on here that you get that um, that shape around the cheetah, which is really, really distinctive. Obviously, you don't get the detail of the spots and so on. And I'll show you a few photos of the detail in the shots coming up. But I really, really like that backlight behind it and just that... Um, yeah, just that, just just being able to see the shape of, of the of the cat. So I'll just move on to cheetahs now, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so cheetahs. Are, there's about seven thousand cheetahs left uh, worldwide now in the wild. That they're one of the species that's really really struggling, and there's quite a lot of reasons for it. Some of it is you know reduction in habitat human wildlife conflict because you know they might go and try and um either people will feel threatened about some of their their livestock um pre other predators is a bit of a problem so hyenas lions and so on it's all competition for for food um, and also you know will either try and hurt the cheetahs themselves or their cubs um and also unfortunately um there's a there's a number of um people that you know do buy cheetahs and buy cheetah cubs. And so there's a whole, um, I call it exotic pet trade. I've got a very <laughs> different name for it. But, you know, the cheetah cubs do get stolen out of the wild in certain areas of Africa. I, I don't think in the Maasai Mara, but they do get stolen. And um, and so it's a real struggle for, for cheetahs. Um, they, you know, if you compare them to something like a leopard, they, they're very, very limited in terms of their diet. So they hunt, um, they, they, for, for their food they don't um choose to um uh they, they don't um basically um uh, scavenge um and they like small gazelles small um antelope and so on whereas something like a leopard you know if it's struggling to find food at any time it can substitute it can basically substitute with things like you know, um, insects and birds and lizards and things like that to help keep it going. So there's quite a lot of pressures on cheetahs and they, they kind of make it difficult for themselves to a certain degree as well. Um, I've been very, very lucky to see a number of different um, cheetahs, but I've just picked this, this um, family tree up from one of the, the charities that, that um, are studying cheetahs in the Maasai Mara. And when I first went in 2009 for, in this particular area, I saw a cat in the, in the top left called um, Shakira. And at that time, um, I think she had four cubs. Um, and as I've been going since 2009, I've seen a number of, of cheetahs that have come from her lineage. And I'm gonna cover a few of those uh, photos specifically from these, from some of these cats. And I think if you, I don't know if you can see all of them, but the, uh, the ones in red are the, the ones that I'm actually gonna show photos of. The blue stars are the, the the cheetahs that I've definitely seen, and I've seen their cubs as well. But to give you an idea, so saw so Shakira in 2009. Um, her granddaughter, Imani, um, I've seen a number of times. We start seeing some photos of Imani, who's her great granddaughter, then Selenke, who's Imani's daughter, then Sila and Sila's cubs. So, so, you know, you're going down sort of six, seven generations. And I guess on, on one side, it's worrying in terms of gene pool, but it's it's really um, a beautiful thing when, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll see cubs, and a few years later, I will see those cheetahs with cubs and, and so on. Um, I think one of the beauties about um, photographing cheetahs is, I mean, I, I like the fact that I, I can see that um, sort of family tree and, and the lineage and so on. Um, but one of the things for me about cheetahs is that they, they you know, they're predominantly on the open plain. They're, they hunt and, and are active during the day. Um, obviously, you will see them sleeping, but can't, they're, they're far more active during the day than the other cats. And really, it's the devotion of the mothers that you see. So, you know, uh, uh, cheetahs are um, solitary animals, at least the females are. Um, they, so, so, you know, a mother does not get any help with her cubs. Um, and she, you know, she has to protect them from predators. She has to find food for them. She has to look after herself because she has to be in a fit state to hunt. And it's there's a real devotion that you can feel. So, you know, when I'm when I'm photographing and when I'm with them, you can kind of feel the vulnerability. There'll, there'll be times when you'll see them really struggling to hunt for a number of days. It might be the hyena or, or other predators take their food off them. Um, 
and it's and the but the bond between them between a mother and cubs is just is fantastic. Um, and here the the cheetah that's on the mound here is um, Amar, uh, Imani, sorry, which was on the right hand side at the top at the top in terms of the family tree. And one of these three cubs on here is um, one called Solenka, who I'll show you um, shortly. This is actually back in 2016, I think. Um, Imani is quite old now and has only unfortunately managed to bring um, one set of cubs through. But one of the, the ones was um, Solenka. I don't know which one it is on here. And, you know, in that, in that week, I was actually very, very fortunate that there's three sets of uh, cheetahs with, you know, quite quite old cubs um, in a very small area. Um, and this, again, is is two of those, those three cubs that were on the, the mound with her. They, there's certain habits that they will have. And I, if you've seen many cheetah photos, you've probably seen them on the on the mound. And the main reason that they're there is it basically enables them to, you know, the bit of a higher elevation, they can look around and see what food opportunities there are. They can look around and it also means they can check for whether or not there's any, any dangers as well. So they'll often try and get, you know, high spots. Um, cheetah cubs will always be playing um you know any chance they can get mum's trying to hunt cheetahs will get in the way and and in this particular case you know i'm back to you know first thing in the morning sun's just starting to rise cheetahs are playing um and we're in a very fortunate position and it's just the way that you know for me this shot is really about the playful image of the cheetahs but also about how that light's picking up the dust as as they're moving through um, this is Imani again. It's actually with a different set of cubs, which unfortunately haven't made it. But um, and but in this case, you know, it's just the grouping of the babies, which is some of the youngest ones that I've seen. Um, but I love the eye contact with the one right at the front with its tongue sticking out. And it's just kind of, I guess it's the humour around it. Um, in terms of this female cat, so this is Selenke. So the three, the three cubs that were on the mound, this is um, one of those cubs. And Solenke started having cubs in 2018. She's now onto a, um, three litters, successful litters, I think. Um, and, you know, I guess she's teaching them all sorts of things. One of the key things for cleaning is about the fact that obviously they're keeping their fur in good condition, they're getting rid of parasites and so on. But to me, um, you know, these mums are amazing. You know, they are really, really looking after their babies. And a shot like this to me, mum looks, you know, I feel, I don't know, I can feel the love between the, the two, the two species, sorry, the two species, the, the mum and, and cub. Um, I don't do that many portraits, but it's just that, um, yeah, look in those eyes. And <laughs> I think even the hardest person would struggle not to melt really. And again, you know, it's just, how do you pick out, um, that love between those two and it's just that mum you know reaching up giving the cat giving her cub a little bit of a nudge and, and just the love and connection between them one of the things about um cheetahs is the in terms of their claws is um i'm going to get this probably wrong they they can't retract so they shouldn't really be able to climb trees but for some reason especially cubs um they absolutely love it and what generally will happen is you'll, you know, mum will be walking along trying to move them to try and get to an area that's either safe or to try and find food. And every single time they find a tree, cubs will try and uh, try and climb it. And um, I don't think it's necessarily the best image, but it's one of those things where all you've got all three and they're just causing chaos. And what will happen is two will come off and then one will, will sit there and wonder how on earth it's going to get down, which is quite common. You can see with the, the cheetahs that, you know, there's that thick layer of hair that's down, the, down their neck. And one of the theories around it is actually that from the skies, they look a bit more like a honey badger. And, and if you, I don't know if you don't, are aware of honey badgers, I've never ever seen one actually live in the wild. But they're really, um, they're relatively small, similar size, look look a little bit similar, but a lot, but are really aggressive. And, you know, a lion will not pick a fight with a honey badger. So one of the theories is that they actually look a little bit like little mini honey badgers and it keeps um, predators away. Because even when they're this sort of size, they're actually at risk from, um, from martial eagles and other, other birds, um, you know, and some of them do get taken. So, it, you know, it's a theory that it just gives them an extra layer of protection. And to me, they kind of look like little mini gremlins at times as well. 
Um, this is another one of Selenka. This is back. Um, this is last year, actually. So she had, she's had um, th three, I think three litters now. I think five or six cubs have come through from those litters. And it's just one of those moments where actually, you know, the cubs actually been a bit naughty, but it looks like <laughs> the cubs actually giving mum a hug. And, um, you know, this is probably one of my favourite more recent cheetah photos. Um, I, I don't know. I just I like the eye contact, um, the, the fact that it's framed with that gap in the tree. Again, the back in a tree playing around. But it's also the fact that, you know, you, it reminds you that whilst they look really cute and cuddly, you can see those claws. You know, they could do some damage if they really wanted. And, you know, of all of the cats, if, and, and I did some volunteer work quite a lot of years ago with, with cheetahs over in Namibia. If you're gonna be in a, a, an enclosure, cheetahs are probably the most safest one that, that you can have, to be honest. Um, but, you know, it's just that fact that they are, at the end of the day, they are predators. So this cat um, we saw um, in July, and this is actually Sila. So one of the cubs you have now you've just seen in the last few photos. This is her uh, two years later, and she's actually uh, two years, three years. Let me get this right. No, it's four years later. I'm missing that lockdown like everyone does. So she's um, she's now on a, a second set of cubs. So she's raised three successfully, um, and you know there's there's some really lovely success stories like hers. And um, there's some really, you know, some really worrying ones as well, if I'm absolutely honest. But in this case, um, we'd been following her for a number of days and she was really struggling to feed. She, there was, she kept being in areas where, the, where there wasn't very much food, um, for a food source for her. There's certain animals like topies that give out warnings. Um, and then the other thing is that she, um, she, she, uh, when she had actually taken food down, hyenas came and took things through. And on this particular day, um, it was actually the skies were really starting to darken. Um, I was starting to get worried because I always worry about these sorts of things, especially when they've got cubs, because, you know, it's just that fear of what's going to happen if she really struggles for another day or two. And then basically the heavens opened and they use that actually as a, as a time to... Um, you know, it brings lots of noise, lots of uncertainty for, for the gazelles and so on. Um, they're a lot less alert than they would normally be. And often cheetahs will use that as an opportunity to hunt. Uh, lions do as well, actually. And in this particular case, um, she she took something down. Uh, the coals over the cubs, cubs come running over. And then we had the most, you know, torrential rainstorm. I think this was ISO 12,800, very slow shut speed, all of the rest of it. But it's, um, you can see how dark the sky was, but it's just, again, the affection between mum and the cub. And then obviously the cub's not really enjoying uh, enjoying that rain shower at all. So Charlotte, let me um, ask you to flip two, maybe three photos um, back. There was a question and you, you flipped fast. So uh, right there, uh, go back that one. Somebody yeah. Carolyn's curious. She's like the tail at the bottom. Is that the mom's tail? Can you tell? Yeah, the, the very the the bigger white tip at the bottom is the mom's tail. Yeah, and what they you know the the tail for them really is their balance. So you know the, the cheetahs when they're hunting, as I'm sure you know, is all about is all about speed. And what the gazelle will um, will do is they'll try and weave in and out to try and and, and zigzag really to try and um, you know, outmaneuver the cheetah, and the cheetah's using that tail really as a as a weight to basically help it help it move when it's having to, to yeah, to to try and follow the gazelle. But yeah, they can see them on the babies. Have got a very um, you know, it's just a tiny white tip on on the baby's tails. So while well, I got while well, I've interrupted, um, Rose was curious um, because you are able to identify, um, yeah cheetahs by name and by family she's wondering do the cheetahs usually stay in the same area and that's why it's easy for them to be tracked or are they I mean is it just the guides or the scouts I mean yeah there's, I mean there's a few things that it's, it's a really good question actually it's um so you know I often get asked when's the best time to go and, and to be fair the weather conditions it's really hard to predict in, in most circumstances but cats are very territorial um I guess leopards and um, lions are more predictable because they don't move around quite as much. Um, but even cheetahs will generally have a territory or a roaming area. 
Um, they may cross over with quite a lot of other cheetahs in this case. You know, what you generally find with lions is you don't get very much crossover. Leopards, you don't get very much, you know, you, people, they'll be trying to defend those territories. Um, cheetahs do roam around, but they will generally roam around only in certain areas. Um, so, yeah, far bigger, far bigger area. So that's one of the things that will give you an idea of which ones they are. The other is... Um, so they're different. There's some different colouring. So some of them are a lot paler than others. There might be markings, you know, because they've got scars and things. But I think the, um, the, the, the people who do a lot of the studies on them, they're looking at, at, their, um, at, their, at their spots effectively. And I think it's often it's the spots on the, the top of their, um, their legs that they actually look at. And that's the distinctive patterns that, that they recognise. Thank you. So if that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> um, last few photos on, on, the, on cheetahs. So this is Quelly um, and one of her cubs that I saw um, a month or two ago. And um, this is actually, I think she ends up, the, the cubs that we just saw, she's some sort of great, great aunt or something. She goes down the other side of, of um, the lineage um, for, for, uh, on Shakira. Um, but, you know, the, it was, I spent quite a few days um, with her and her now um, three cubs. They're just under a year old, I think. Um, you know, I love this shot because, again, you've got that, you can see this, how much affection there is. What happens when, we come, we'll come to leopards, but um, what happens with leopards is, you know, they're solitary. And it's really from a very young age that often you won't see mum and, and cub together very much. Um and you you might see some affection, but you can feel that they're already starting to move apart. With things like cheetahs, you know, they could be with mum until 18 months, two years. Um, she'll be training them to how to hunt. Um, and, and all the time, you, you know, there'll be a point where they start to sit apart a little bit more, but they'll still come together and help each other clean and stuff. So this particular photo, I, I love because you've still got that devotion and you've got, you know, I guess it's the shape of the heads together. Um, a, a few seconds later, one of them's got a bit sick now of um, <laughs> of being clean. I just love the expressions difference between the, you know, when all of a sudden I'm grumpy now and don't really want this. Thanks very much, Mum. And it just shows you really, you know, if I had to show you one photo from that day, would I show you the 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 the, the sort of, you know, sort of nice warm smiley photo or do I show you the more you know grouchy photo that's probably me at half past one in the morning actually <laughs> and and um and finally I mean this is this is mum they have you know like I've said they have a really hard life um but this is mum first thing in the morning having a roll around and and um it's just that sort of expression on her face and uh, you know that yeah I, I it's one of my favorite photos actually that I've taken of a cheetah but I think also it's hard when you taking shots as things that mean things to you either because you build that relationship with the cats or you um you know you remember all of that story around it. and it's sometimes quite hard I think with photos um which ones mean things to you and what things can people resonate on the other side and very very finally actually this is probably one of my favorite ever cheetah photos totally different lineage from what we've talked through already um but way back in 2010 um there was a mother that actually had six cubs. It's quite rare to see, I think I've seen seven um, very, very briefly, but it's quite rare to see so many cubs. And this mum actually managed to get them all to adulthood. And if you think what that job would have been, because as they get older, you know, they obviously has to hunt and hunt and hunt. She must have been absolutely exhausted. Um, but in this particular case, she's gone up a tree to get the elevation so she can get a good scout around for food. And all the cubs have, have gone up and joined her. And the photographer that I was, I was with at the time, um, who you know taught me how to take my camera out of automatic paul goldstein he put a, a similar he will say better image it's probably true um into the wildlife photographer of the year um awards that year and this is one of the final uh, you know his his um, photo that he took that day was one of the finalists and you know it was a really very unique moment very um you know special moment okay um, right, I'm going to quickly go into leopards and I'll try not to talk too much. I'm sorry if I'm going on a bit too much. Um, in terms of leopards, so um, I guess the first time, a few times I went, and this is trying to set expectations, um, I saw the back of a tail the first time and the second time. Not This, is, this wasn't to this area, it was earlier in 2000s. 
And the second time I saw what apparently was a leopard somewhere in the, the undergrowth. And I was the most excited person in the world. Um, and, you know, think how things change, really. Um, but when I started to, to go regularly, there was two cats that I used to see quite a lot. And one of them was Acacia, which is this female, really calm, absolutely fine with 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 vehicles and so on and the, and also pink nose and pink nose is a male and it's actually you know males are a lot shyer leopards are in you know they live in um in riverbeds effectively with lots of vegetation it's actually really beautiful because you get all these kingfishers flying around and beaters and you know really beautiful noises um from all the birds and so on and really sort of pretty locations but if they don't want to be found on that day they can just go in a bush. You would never know they're there. And, you, you know, with the spots and everything, sometimes you're sat there, the guide's telling you it's there and you can't see it. I mean, probably about my eyesight, but, um, you know, it can be really challenging and it's really impressive, what, how, you know, how good they are at spotting things. But here, Pink Nose, he was quite a unique male, really, um, because, he, again, he wasn't bothered about vehicles and you got to see him um, quite a lot and a very relaxed cat. And, and a male, actually, is really pretty as well. Often they get quite, you know, big necks, lots of scratches and fights and he was a real pretty boy as well and called pink nose because of his nose um and I went in I think it's back in 2012 actually and um and Acacia had got a, a four-month-old cub and this is one of my first interactions um with this cub um who basically walked up to the vehicle you know I'm saying to you please don't you know encroach on on on, on wildlife of course the wildlife don't know if they you know they're not to encroach on you and in this particular case, the cub came up to the vehicle and was really inquisitive about what this lens was that was sticking down looking at her. Um, and this was Fig. Um, and, um, you know, Fig, uh, so this is 2012, Fig sadly um, passed away um, early last year, um, which was a big shock at the time. But, you know, to put it into perspective, and we'll go through a, a few of my, you know, favourite photos of her and her cubs, but to put it into perspective, you know, she... She, she was an amazing cat. She loads of tolerance. She got it all from her mum and all the rest of it. Um, um, but she did, you know, she did actually bring four um, four cubs as well to adulthood. And, you know, it's it's very easy to get saddened and everything else. It's trying to really look at the positive and, and you know, how her, her cubs have moved on as well. But again, on the same trip, this was her. I mean, she, yeah, a real beauty. And one of the things about Fig... Um, I think with the growth of social media, you know, she was on social media a lot because um, because she really, you know, every time you went, you knew that you were going to see her. I don't think I ever, ever went and didn't spend quite a bit of time with her. When when they do um, when they do um, give birth, they often go quiet during those times a lot. You know, obviously staying, first of all, heavily pregnant, then, um, you know, trying to shelter the, the very young cubs. So it might be that they're more hard to see during those periods. But you know, really um, stunning cat. And I guess I saw her, that was back in 2012. Had a little bit of a break actually. And then one day we went out and, oh, this is a fig, this is the cat, you know, this is the cub that I'd seen. And, and from that point on, um, lots and lots of interaction with her. And, you know, the thing with, with leopards, like I say, first of all, they can hide um, if they choose to and you know at all times with fig it's not that she's got loads of vehicles chasing around her. her her territory means that if she doesn't want to be seen she can very very easily um get away from all of that and the other thing is i i would hate to think how many hours i've spent of my life just watching her sleep you know so so um you know one morning got there at 6 a.m she was fast asleep in a tree we left at one i think the whole time she came you know she must have lifted her head had a yawn moved around, gone back to sleep again. And that's, you know, that's often um, what leopards do. So, I, you know, lots of affection, amazing, beautiful, beautiful cats. But, you know, we, we've got cheetahs that are a lot more active. So you've got very, very different behaviours. Again, one of the things with cats, you know, she loved um, one of these termite mounds. It was a really, really high termite mound, was a regular spot for her um, to, to sit on. And again, it's all about the fact that they, they like the elevation in terms of being able to see potential, um, you know, dinner opportunities, I guess. And this particular morning, um, we knew that she, she'd she made a kill the day before. And, you know, often they will, don't always, but often they will stash their, their kill high up in the trees and it's to try and keep, you know, hyenas, lions and so on 
from actually stealing the, that food. So we knew that she she had got food up up there, and it's like so it's you know it's one of the signs that she's likely to to be back in the area at some point. So this is a, probably a good example of you know why why it's awful when the alarm goes off, but why it's important to get up early because in this particular case we were down there. Um, you know, by the tree. Fortunately, she was in the tree with the kill and she came down just as the sun was rising. So obviously just getting that, that shape. And of course, sometimes, unfortunately, the trees are a bit messy. In this, in this case, we were really lucky. In fact, in fact, that open tree. Um, back in 2016, um, she, she, she had a few litters that didn't, didn't work out. In 2016, she had a son called Alari. And this is Alari. I think he was just under uh, 12 months old in this particular case. Um, and normally with, with leopards, they probably would have their cubs. I think if you read in the books, they'll say 18 months, something like that, before they they start to, um, you know, to, to stop before they, their independence. Fig was a little bit naughty. What she seemed to do on a regular basis was that she, before they even got to a year old, she was already mating again. Next litter was on the way. And, and these cats had to find, you know, their, their own way. Um, and in this particular case, Larry was already really independent. He was taking down young Topi. Um, and then the male lions, off, oh, sorry, male leopards often then just disappear. Um, and you don't really know what's, what's happened um, to them. Be, you know, going, goes back to them being shy. And Larry, interestingly enough, we heard a few years ago that he'd been sighted, but I think about three months ago, um, he was sighted in a completely different area of the Mara um, and and has seemed to, you know, has now developed a territory, which, you know, it needs to happen because obviously you're thinking about gene pools and so on and making sure that that um, there's no inbreeding. It's it's what happens, but he's obviously covered a large area um, uh, to, and, and now has established his own territory. But it's, you know, just hearing the news, I haven't seen him actually since he's, is is now in full adulthood, but just hearing the news that he's doing well is amazing. And again, that comes down to the fact that, particularly on leopards, it's often around the um, uh, there is colouring and so on, but it's often around the markings around their neck that that people can get an idea of who they are. A second one was um, second cub was Figlet. Figlet was all over social media at the time because they're often born with with blue eyes, but very very quickly changed to sort of yellowy yellowy green colour. And Figlet had these, you know, really beautiful um, baby blue eyes. Um, I first saw her in 2017. Um, again, mum, you know, um, this was, yeah, I think it was around Christmas. Um, I don't actually have that, I realised I don't actually have that many photos with Cub and mum. And part of that reason, again, comes back to the fact that from a very young age, yeah, they do interact, but the interaction levels is so much less than what you would see for cheetahs, because mum will just go out and hunt and just leave them in the tree and, you know, could leave them for a day or, or so. Um, it's a very different status than with cheetahs where they're always with their mother. And in this particular case, so there's actually a Nat Geo, I don't know if um, anyone's seen it, but there's a Nat Geo uh, documentary called Jade Eyed Leopard, which I would recommend if you can find it. Um, and it's actually about um, this particular um, leopard cub. Um, I think they give it a different name, but she's commonly known as, as Figlet. Um, and in this particular case, they, they, they had a kill. They kept it in a tree for two or three days. So again, you know pretty much where they're going to be because they're going to keep going back to feed. I think this, I, I have intentionally kept away from things like kill, um, kills and so on. Personally, I never find them easy to see. Um, but, you know, they're predators and they need to eat. And I think, um, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult, but it's just part of life. Um, in this case, you know, Unfortunately, a young zebra had to had to pay, but the the you know the leopard has to also eat. So I kind of for me it's there's a sadness to it, but it's but it's also the fact that um yeah, it's a circle of life at the end of the day. And it's important, obviously, that, that you don't want the leopard to starve either. So it's one of those sort of challenging photos, I think. And it's also, I mean, look at the eyes again. <laughs> it's quite unusual. And again, you know, there's there's big blade baby blue eyes. The last time I saw her, actually the light on this one makes her eyes look um, quite yellow, but she still has got those, those blue eyes. This is one of the last times I saw her. And again, mum had already moved on to baby number three by this point. Um, and she, to start with, she stayed. So mum has this large territory that um, 
a case who had died and, and Fig had really quite a big territory. And to start with, Figlet took over a little bit of that territory and then has slowly moved. And I hadn't heard anything for quite a while. And then a few months ago, um, she's she's actually got two cubs again in a very different area of the Mar um in the sort of Mara region. But again, is another one of those that's doing well. And I'm actually hoping if I can to go and see her, but um, you know, again, it's in a, in a different area. And then the next one that came along, so there's a poor old figlet's pushed out, mum comes along and it's Faraha. And um, and on this particular morning, um, you know, again, got down there early, uh, found mum, and then she calls out the baby. And the this is actually them play fighting. So they're rolling around. And, and in this particular case, you know, it's, it's one of those things with photography, I'm sure you know, that sometimes you take a shot and it gives a very different story from what actually what's happening. And here, obviously, it looks like mum's, you know, but the mum that keeps abandoning them at nine months old is actually, uh, you know, giving them a hug and, and and you know it's just I love the eye contact to be fair on the cub and that sort of big smile. Uh, second female, um, and again you know this is when they're play fighting and poor old mum squashing squashing Faraha's face. One of my favourite ever leopard sightings was um, on this particular morning, and um, and also one of my favourite leopard shots. Not this one, the next one. I think we're about to come to. And and um, again going back to males, it's quite it's normally rare to see a male. Um, and when you do see them, you don't see them interact with their cubs. And, and just in the same way with cheetahs, occasionally you'll see photos on, on social media or you might see it yourself if you're lucky where the female with cubs comes across some males. But it's, you know, it's not a common thing at all. And of course, those males may not be the, the, the father. In this particular case, um, that morning, this morning, we saw um, a male, lion, a male le uh, leopard in a tree. A bit later on, we saw fig. And Fig was calling for Aha. So she'd left her overnight somewhere. Faraha ran across and, and I took this shot, which is when they, they first greeted each other. And there was lots of noise, lots of cuddles. And then and then um they moved over to an area and the male leopard, golden balls as it's called, had moved down. And then we had this most incredible morning where sorry about the video quality, but we had this most incredible morning where we had all three of them together. It will settle down in a minute. Um, we had this incredible morning where all three of them um, sat down. Mum, um, you know, you can see Faraha's wanting to play to play with mum. Then she goes over to dad. You know, you think dad might be a little bit aggressive. He was the most relaxed, calm, chilled cat that morning. And, um, you know, it's the first time I'd ever, I have ever seen a cub um, with its father. So the fact that you've got all three together was was really, really unique. And you can see he's really not that bothered. Um, in a minute, Fig will actually get um, a bit out. I think she wasn't really happy about him being there. So you can hear, hear my shutter, can't you? <laughs> um, Come on, Fig, move. Um, but she really wasn't happy about him being there and, and sort of taps him on the head. But he just had this complete calmness and really wasn't bothered. She'd be a lot noisier and a lot more aggressive if she really wanted to be. And this is one of the photos that I took of, of the interaction. So again, you you know, the male just sat there and took everything. Fig was getting knocked off with, sorry, getting annoyed with him, tapping him on the head, and the baby was, was trying to play at the same time. And he just, you can just see he just really isn't bothered. And and it's just really, really unusual to see that interaction between the three of them. Ironically enough, actually, the next time I went, um, mum had already pushed Faraha out of, um, uh, away. And really uh, that morning we actually found golden bowls and fig together and they were mating. And, um, but Faraha was still around and Faraha still wanted love and attention. Um, and the ironic thing was that Fig would have nothing to do with her. She really wasn't happy, but Dad was the one that did. But in this particular case, you can see there's me in my... Uh, again, I'm going back to, you know, don't impede on the animals. The animals don't necessarily know whether or not they're going to impede on you. And um, in this particular case, we'd parked up, Fig walks up, Golden Balls walks up. They sit next to our, our Jeep and then decide to mate right next to me, <laughs> which, again, isn't common. I've only ever seen um, them, uh, you know, cats mating twice, I think, in a time. And very quickly, um, during another lockdown period, 
uh, cub number three happened. So this was Fowlu. This is um, early last year. Um, uh, and Fowlu um, uh, was kicked out because mum was pregnant. Unfortunately, when Fig died, she was, she was actually quite heavily pregnant at the time. But Fowlu um, now is is right on the border between the National Reserve and the, and the Conservancy that I visit and is, is doing well as well. And this is actually the last shot that I took of Fig. And um, I get very, very, I get quite emotional still, which is quite funny, bearing in mind, you know, it's, it is just a cat and there's big things going on in the world and all the rest of it. But, you know, I've spent a lot of hours as with, with, with Fig and, and, you know, but just, just a really, really, really great cat. And then just very, very quickly. So her, her territory then becomes, becomes empty. Um, and yeah, Fowler's in one little ledge, but what, what happens next? And, and what's happened is there's another female leopard that's been in a near location for quite some time that's had cubs over the years. And one of those cubs is Natito, which is this cat here. I was back um, just over a month ago and Natito started to move into that territory. Um, and this is incredibly early in the morning. Uh, God knows what I say this was. Um, but she's been to the territory and she's now got two cubs that she's she's been hiding in, in, in the rocks there. So there's a sadness around Fig, but, you know, we're now moving on to the sort of next generation. And it's really about, um, yeah, the, you know, what will the future hold? And hopefully Natito and Fowlu will, will take over that territory. And, um, you know, there'll be lots of new, new exciting stories going forward. And that's that's me done. <laughs> Sorry, there's like quite a lot there. <laughs> Yay! I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I'm fortunate because I I've I have been following you for so long, and and um, so I've seen a lot of these photos, but a lot of them I hadn't seen. So it was kind of exciting to see. So I know you have a huge catalog, Charlotte Rhodes. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you to take your screen down. There are a few questions that I just want to um, put in front of you and hopefully you can. Um, um, Jamie's curious. Um, this is a really good question because um, so you, you mentioned in your presentation about a bathroom break. So are you just going in the wild? Is, is that, is, <laughs> you're out there for hours because you know, one day, yeah, and have a teeny tiny bladder. So, so I'm guessing there's no porta potties out there. You're basically yeah. a tree or a tire. I think it depends where. Um, I think it depends probably where you go in the Mara because it is. Uh, I think there's probably some areas Africa where you can probably find toilets. Yeah. Um, but because this is yeah, it's out. It's it's very much out in the wild. Yeah, you're you're finding a a space. So yeah. Generally, what happens is you're finding some bushes and the, and the guide's making sure there's nothing in those bushes that can harm you before you do. Yeah. Um, yay, guides. Okay. So, so <laughs> I, I know that you go to uh, private res reserves, but Susan was curious, are you visiting national parks or are you mostly in private reserves? Or um, I predominantly go in... Um, yeah, and the the the, the Mas there's a Maasai Mara reserve that's owned by the in, in this particular case it's owned by the government. And there's what's known as conservancies, which are owned owned by the I guess the local land landowners that are there. Um, and I have a preference for that because um, they limit the amount of um, vehicles um, that are in those areas. The camps are a good standard, but also and they limit the number of people that can be at any one sighting. And that can be frustrating because of the fact that you might want to see something, but it also means that, you know, the animals are, are have got a, a limited, um, into, it's, you know, it's limiting the amount of effect we have on, on those animals as well. And um, so I, that's what I generally choose to do. But I do sometimes go into the reserve um, and in other parts of Africa, I have gone into sort of more of the national parks as well. Okay, um, so this is a question Barbara had. Um, during the middle of the day when the sun is really high and the light's not maybe so great, do you take breaks in the middle of the day? Or yeah. do, you, do you nap when they nap or? Um, yeah, I mean, um, if there's often there's nothing, you know, if there's nothing happening, why be out really? So um, 
most commonly we will, you know, when it gets, we'll have breakfast out. Um, if there's nothing much going on, if you think a cheetah is going to hunt, you might still stay out. Um, but generally speaking, you'll, I'll go back and I'll have lunch, have a, have a nap, download my photos, and then you're out again. And it really, you know, people say, what do you do? But of course, you know, going out really early, you end up, you know, going to bed quite early really as well. And it's, but it's just a full, it just feel like a full on day. Occasionally, if, if you're there and there's like things like wildebeest crossings and stuff, those can obviously happen at any time of day. So you might stay out all day in those, in those occasions. Um, but even then I would probably try and find a nap during, during the middle of the day, unless something was happening. I like my sleep. <laughs> um, don't we all? Um, so let's see here. Um, Jane snuck in one on me here. Let's see. She says there's a black and white photo where the leopard is reunited with a cub from overnight, I think. Do you know yeah. why they were separated? They, um, it's really about really from a very early age, um, you know, leopards are solitary. Um, and so the, there is that independence really from an early age. So mum will can leave the cubs in a tree go off to hunt or just get some peace and quiet knowing that they're relatively safe and just and just leave them for a day or whatever okay um all right one last question um lens what's the longest lens you use or take with you yeah. <laughs> Until the last year or so, the longest I really will have taken will have been um, a 300 with a, you know, with a 1.4 convert. So 420 or up to 600 if I, if I put a doubler on it. Um, and I think, to be honest, that that is probably as much as you need, because in most cases, you know, you're talking about big species. It depends whether you want to take birds and things. And I think birds, sometimes you might, depending on what birds they are, you might need a little bit longer. But for me, that's kind of like the perfect the perfect lens um and that also goes back to the question earlier on about bodies and so on if you've got a really long lens you you don't want to take a really long lens and one body because you you know something comes a bit close to you you're stuck, you're stuck so yeah. yeah if you've got 100 to 400 or something like that it's a pretty good you know sort of lens combination to have all right well those are all the questions i had um i don't know how to say thank you other than thank you. And it doesn't seem like it's, you know, heartfelt, but it is Charlotte. I have been, I was actually a little nervous to have you because I was just, I was so excited. I really didn't think you would do it. And I thought, <laughs> oh, how do I get her to do this? And so I've been so excited and, you know, I, people that are in this room know every once in a while I joke about this being Linda's selfish hour. This was very, very selfish of me. And um, I wanted I wanted you to do this. And um, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. Maybe I can get you to come back and talk about elephants and zebras and giraffes. Yeah, of course, yeah. And, and I guess, you know, I at that point as well, you know, I've got um, some nice elephant and giraffe shots from other parts of Africa. It doesn't just have to be uh, the Mara as well. So yeah, I'd be happy to. I would love that. So, um, because that you, I mean, I know you love the cats. The cats are cute and um, they're great, but the elephants, <laughs> the zebras, that's what I'm, that's what I'm in love with. So thank you for doing this, Charlotte. I, it means the world to me. Thank you so very no, much. Thank you. And thank you for people for, you know, joining and spending time as well. I appreciate it. You guys, you can connect with Charlotte on Instagram at Charlotte Rhodes Wildlife. And that is Charlotte underscore Rhodes underscore Wildlife. Next week, Michigan-based photographer Beth Bulow will be here to share her abstract images using a technique called ICM and offering tips on how you can consistently and successfully employ the skill to create one of the to create one of a kind images in her presentation experience photography freedom with intentional camera movement until next time go out and create something beautiful and i hope that we see you again soon <music>